In today's video, I'm going to talk about very important topic of delay analysis and claims management, which is hot topic around the table among client and contractor that who owns the total floor. Yes, I'm going to talk about in all situations and uh, thumb rule that if you are working as a delay analyst, a senior planning engineer, and you are surrounded by such kind of discussions that who owns the total floor, even if I talk about job interviews, they are going to check your knowledge as well. So stay tuned till the end of today's video. And before starting this video in details, I would request you people to write in the comment area, delay analysis and claims management so that most of the people who are relevant to our this video can approach this video. And I will request you people to subscribe this channel as well. So let's start and I will take you on my presentation slide who owns a project total float. So let break it down step by step. What is total float actually? First of all, we have to understand what is the total float, right? And why either parties are claiming about it and how to solve this problem, right? So let me share with you one uh, Gantt chart over here and you can uh, see very clearly that this is our critical path, right? Which is having zero float. Whereas uh, the activities which are starting from here and ended up over here. So this is our flexibility. Uh, you can say that uh, there are 15 days, right? So this is the number of days equal to the total float. So that is actually the total float. What is total float? It is flexibility in a project on the timeline of non-critical activities, right? Now, uh, what is this one? It's already explained, but now why either parties are going to, uh, you know, claim for it? Because on the timeline of your project, if anything is going to miss out, delays, so parties are bound to pay for that one, right? So that is why they are going to claim it. This is my property. So I'm going to explain that one. So if we talk about, see, this is our real scenario, right? In the Gantt chart, something happened out of slavers, right? something like this one. This was the monsoon rainy season, political strike due to which something, this was delayed. And on the same page, the non-critical activities is also delayed. So now your total float is already consumed. So now you can see this is also becomes critical. So if anything be uh, going to be delayed, you know, I have just drawn these bars as per the ideal situation but if this bar would look like this one and this would look like this one it will be crossing this contractual completion date it's already crossing this one so who pay uh, you know th these 15 days were consumed in this delay risk right so extra two days so if that delay is happened by contractor side or employer side that is concurrent so whose delay will be given that flexibility or facility to use that total float, right? So that is actually the whole agenda you need to understand. So let me share with you uh, over here that if it is from the contractor point of view, contractor's position, the contractor is going to argue that total float belongs to the project because it is generated through efficient scheduling, sequencing and resource allocation. As of now, if I recall as a planning engineer point of view that uh, you have struggled a lot on Primavera P6, you have, um, uh, you know, prepared a model in which everything is integrated, like your time is integrated with your cost, scope, resources, your strategy is portrayed on that Gantt chart, right? So contractor is going to go with that argument. This is my work, my strategy, my resource deployment. So this total float is generated there as per my strategy so i uh, i own it right so on the other hand since the contractor develops and updates the program they claim the right to use float for their own benefit that's what i was explaining a moment ago if there are 20 days uh, you can say uh, of the total float and uh, non critical activities the contractor may delay that activity by 10 days without affecting the overall obviously total float are the number of days you can consume and uh, without uh, you know uh, uh, completion uh, disturbing of the project completion date right so that is the stance of contractors position 
So on the other hand, the other party, the employer's client's position, the employer argues that uh, total float belongs to the project, not exclusively to the contractor. So this is project's property, right? Somehow it's also justifiable. In many contractors, especially FIDIC and government contracts, float is treated as a shared resource. Yes, that is uh, kind of justifiable. This means if an employee delays occurs, the client can consume the float first before granting an extension of time. So there is something like that, right? So this prevents the contractor from benefiting twice, first from float, then from claiming EOT. Let me clear it about it very sim uh, in simple way. Uh, if any delay is occurring on non-critical path, there is a total float and this delay is happened by contractor. So if contractor is going to claim it, so it will go in the favor of contractor. That total float can be consumed in that specific situation. EOT can be granted, but uh, cost will not be granted, right? But if before the contractor's delay, if any delay is happened by the employer side, so that is the linked situation that sequence of activities are on the non-critical path. There is a certain amount of total float. So then this total float priority, if reported by employer, then it will be given to the employer side, the favor I'm talking about, right? So that is a simple agenda. So industry guidance, uh, as per the contract, Society of Construction Law, uh, you know, and disruption protocol, second edition, unless the contract express uh, states otherwise, total float should be considered for the benefit of the project as a whole. So as a whole, the total float is the project property right not employer not contractor but unless until which party is going to make delay in that specific situation so favors goes to that party meaning whichever delay hits the float first consumes it first right so that is the your that should be the, your answer only when employer delays pushes the program beyond available float and eot should be granted right and uh, then further on you can see that practical application if the contract is silent and float ownership yeah are uh, tribunals arbitrators often apply the project property principle some contracts may include specific clauses contract owns a float a contractor owns a float employer owns a float shared float whatever you have to consult with your contract clauses right so uh, conclusion by default total float is a shared project resource first come first serve that is a policy right if employer is going to make some delay and that is on the non-critical path, so total flows float will be uh, flowing towards the employer uh, side, right? And in other case, other situation, if contractor is going to cause any delay and the total float is there on the non-critical path, so it uh, goes towards the contractor side. So that is the simple situation and conclusion as well. So I hope you got very important concept out of this one if you are struggling in planning so you should understand epc planning there is a link above on my head you can click right now and start watching all those videos which are going to strengthen more uh, in that concepts application of primary p6 right and if you want to understand eot delay analysis and claims management with full red book scl double ac ebook uh, and along with Primera P6 methodology application with real project situation and scenarios and templates and Excel and many more amazing things, you can just uh, click the link given in this video details and uh, approach my team and enroll in delay analysis and claims management as well. Thank you very much.